All right, uh, welcome everyone to our, uh, I think, second uh, MISS uh, seminar for this semester. Um, We're super excited to welcome uh, Ryan Gallagher, who um, I think I first met Ryan at um, the only ICA I went to, uh, if, if I'm correct. And, um, He's been doing really interesting work at the intersection of social media and marginalization and um, such. He is a network science PhD candidate at Northeastern University and is a member of the communication media and uh, marginalization lab at Northwestern's uh, Northeastern's uh, Network Science Institute. Uh, he studies how individuals use online communication networks to amplify their voices and how that amplification resonates through online media ecologies. To do so, his research makes advances in network science and text as data methodology to develop new approaches for measuring the complexities of polarization, misinformation, and the networked public sphere. Uh, Ryan also interned with Facebook uh, core data science team and their political organizations and society team, where he developed methods for identifying inauthentic coordination information operations and spent two summers as a visiting research assistant at USC's uh, Information Science Institute. He also holds a, a master's in math from the University of Vermont and uh, where he worked with the computational story lab at the Vermont Complex System Center and has a bachelor in math from the University of Connecticut. Um, and with that, uh, take it away, Ryan, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm very excited to speak with you all today. Um, so yes, <laughs> you did all the, the introductions, right? My name is Ryan. Um, I am a PhD candidate. I've been getting this question a couple of times today, but I will be on the job market starting this coming summer and fall. So I'll be graduating in about a year from now. Okay, so I guess we can dive right into it. Um, today I'll be talking about some work that I've been, do that I've been doing regarding amplification online. Um, and before we get started though, I just wanna give a brief heads up. That I'm going to be using Me Too as a recurring case study in this talk. Um, and so my talk will be touching on the issue of sexual violence against women within that context. Okay, so I'm going to start with the statement that amplification is one of the key affordances of social media. On nearly all social media sites, there's some way to amplify things, whether that be other users, content, or communities. And so, for example, in October 2017, we saw many women simultaneously and publicly disclose experiences of sexual violence with the hashtag MeToo. It's recorded that in the first 48 hours, MeToo was used over 12 million times on Facebook and over 1 million times on Twitter, with, oh, with up to 45% of Facebook users having a friend who disclosed MeToo. The MeToo movement was started by activist Toronto Burke, but it gained widespread visibility online after a tweet from actress Alyssa Milano. Now at the start of this, Milano was accused of co-opting Burke's movement, Milana says she was unaware, and in doing so, she attempted to center Burke by amplifying her directly a few hours into the hashtag campaign. And so what this amplification did in her retweet was it created a connection between her and Burke. And we can imagine this connection like the edge I've drawn here. But as we know, Me Too grew far beyond just these two people, and it was amplified by many others. You know, so the hashtag was shared on Facebook, the hashtag was shared on Facebook by activists whose posts reach a variety of different people, including college professors, high school students, and otherwise ordinary users. It was covered by the New York Times shortly after its creation, and the reporting was shared on their reporting was shared by major internet personalities, including through their stories on Instagram. Men started taking stories from me r slash me too, the subreddit, and ask, and posting them to r slash ask Reddit, a forum for posing questions to ask if they had been complicit in sexual violence against women. Organizations dedicated to sexual health like Planned Parenthood posted about Me Too on numerous platforms, including Tumblr. The hashtag was so pre prevalent that some themed blogs like aesthetic ones, black and white ones, started to share Me Too posts despite that aesthetic. The hashtag reached academia, the film industry, and other more niche communities like beauty YouTube, 
Those YouTubers shared their stories and others reacted and responded to them. The hashtag was embedded in political art and made its way beyond just activists to average people like stay at home mothers who would otherwise not usually engage in hashtag activism. And unfortunately, those who were banned from Twitter for harassment and abuse around Me Too migrated to Mastodon instances like Gab, where far right extremists quickly started maligning the hashtag. Now, all of these are examples of amplification. They happen in a variety of different ways between these different entities, but they are all critical to how these platforms function. And all of these instances of Me Too amplification can be represented in terms of the nodes and the edges. The node here on the left indicates the amplifier, the node on the right indicates the entity being amplified, and the edge indicates the connection made through that amplification. Now, all amplification takes place within the context of other amplification. It's not just a single connection. Other users made various pieces of content about Me Too, including text, photos, videos, reels, stories, so on. And other users amplified that content, curating which posts and which users were the most widely seen. And so this means that there's not just one connection, but rather many that came together to form a network of amplification. Each link indicates that one user amplified another by sharing that user's content. And so this is what my research studies on, the network structure. This is what my research focuses on, the network structure of amplification. And so in this talk, we're gonna first look at how interpersonal interactions led to the emergence of Me Too. And then we're gonna step back and look at the larger patterns that emerged from all those individual interactions. And then I'll talk about how those patterns can be modeled statistically and then show why we need to take a network of the amplification to understand hashtag active instances like Me Too. So starting with that, how do we explain the emergence of Me Too? How do we explain why many women publicly uh, disclose their experience of sexual violence when most never share their stories with anyone? Now, there are many reasons, of course, um, but I'm gonna focus on a particularly important one for the amplification of Me Too, which is network level reciprocal disclosures. Um, this was a term introduced uh, by our host here, uh, Nazanin, and in her, uh, in her studies with Forte, they looked at how women disclose pregnancy loss, how women, how women disclose pregnancy loss online, which is another highly stigmatized experience. And what they found was that some women publicly and directly disclosed their pregnancy losses to their entire Facebook networks. And some, when they did it, they did it because it helped them cope with the loss. Some did it because it helped them prevent rumors from spreading. And some did it because it allowed them to avoid having the conversation over and over with uh, individuals one-on-one. -on -one. But other women disclosed their pregnancy losses exactly because they saw another woman in their social network disclose her own pregnancy loss. And so this is what we refer to as a network level of reciprocal disclosure. So the disclosure that's prompted by seeing another one's network make a disclosure about a similar experience. And so what this does is it describes a mechanism for how a disclosure can propagate through the network. So the idea is that first there's a disclosure by someone in the network. And for those who have had a similar experience, it helps reduce the stigma around it. And then because of this reduction in stigma, another person then feels comfortable making a disclosure of their own. And this is the network level of civil disclosure because it's in response to seeing another person's disclosure. In turn, then, that might reduce the stigma for someone else and cause them to make their own disclosure, further propagating through this network. So what we're going to do is start by asking how network level of reciprocal disclosures may have facilitated the amplification of Me Too. What we want to ask is how did the hashtag snowball from these many individual disclosures? So the way that we went about looking at this was taking a mixed methods approach. First, we conducted a qualitative content analysis of tweets containing the hashtag from the first two weeks of its widespread use in October, 2017. We then used the labeling from that content analysis to train a model for classifying if a tweet from a period was a disclosure of sexual violence or not. And then we used that to study disclosures in aggregate across the 1.5 million tweets that occurred during that time period. So for this first bit of qualitative content analysis, we subsampled 2,500 Me Too tweets, and that's what we conducted um, our inductive qualitative content analysis on. And you know, broadly, and maybe obviously, tweets can fall into two disjoint categories. Either it was a disclosure or it was not. And so there are a number of interesting themes uh, that were in terms of 
tweets that were not disclosures, including discussions about the prevalence of sexual violence against women, uh, the actions of various political and entertainment figures, and those critiquing and maligning the hashtag. And on the other hand, for disclosures, they can broadly be broken down into descriptive and non-descriptive disclosures, which I'll describe in just a moment. But here, what we're going to do is just focus on those disclosures and less on uh, kind of all the non-disclosure discussion that was going on at the time of Me Too. So of these two types of disclosures, non-descriptive disclosures are those that only tweeted using the hashtag Me Too. Um, so this was the only thing in the tweet or just as something like, quote Me Too, hashtag Me Too. And sometimes it might've been a reply to often a celebrity like Alyssa Lana who shared her original tweet or Lady Gaga who also had a popular tweet. Uh, these made up about a third of all the disclosures that we studied. But all the other disclosures will be called descriptive disclosures. And so these are those that attach any amount of narrative, basically any other kind of substantial text beyond just the Me Too hashtag. And what I want to note is this is kind of notably different from, non uh, from the non-descriptive disclosures. You know, given the intimacy and the potential risk of sharing details with the disclosure, the descriptive disclosures indicate that the author had some level of more comfort with disclosing. And so we'll kind of circle back to that a little in just a bit. So having labeled what we did, you know, so we went through, we did our content analysis. And as we're doing this, we're labeling tweets as disclosures or not. And having labeled 2,500 tweets as disclosures or not, we use that to create an algorithm in the classifier of disclosures and tweets. And we did this so that we could study disclosure across the entire MeToo network. And so it's at this point that I want to acknowledge that we're kind of writing an ethically fine line here. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. Uh, because algorithmically classifying tweets as disclosures is equivalent to algorithmically identifying survivors of sexual violence. And as you might be able to imagine, this can be easily abused. So I'm gonna talk about a number of precautions that we took around this. The first uh, are related to the features that we actually use in this model and that they're actually, a number of them are quite specific to this period of time. Uh, and so here's what some of them are. We, we did feature engineer ourselves. So me and my co-author having read all these tweets, we sat down and we kind of thought of what might uh, separate SIFT, a disclosure from a non-disclosure and we came up about 50 in total. And most of them here are what we call lexical, uh, lexical features. So there's some that are like, if it is or is not a non-descriptive disclosure, uh, if it was in reply to Alyssa Milano, it was quite predictive. Other things like number of photos and hashtags. But all these lexical ones are just words and phrases that people use in, uh, in their tweets. And the thing is about these, uh, for these lexical features, many of these phrases in general are not predictive of a disclosure of sexual violence. So for example, a personal pronouns in our data set and in this instance are predictive of a disclosure. You know, you have instances like, you know, this happened to me or I experienced this. And those help predict disclosures in our data set, but in general, those certainly not be predictive of disclosure. And so this is kind of interesting because it means our classifier is not good at generalizing outside of this two week period or these specific tweets. But in the case of trying to kind of create a methodology that cannot be easily abused, this is okay. Um, we're focused on this particular instance of hashtag activism and we're not trying to come up with a model that can classify uh, survivors of sexual violence in general across all contexts and social media platforms. And this reduces the chances that the model can be abused. Uh, but we take a number of other precautions, you know, so for example, we have not released the classifier publicly and any researcher looking to use it has to sign a use agreement with us. The tweets behind this study are also not openly available. Um, they're only available upon proof of IRB and a restricted use agreement through uh, University of Michigan's ICPSR. Uh, we conducted all of our analyses in aggregate, so we're not tracking how individual users, you know, evolved before or after this event. And in all of our studies and presentations, we do not directly quote any individuals who tweeted uh, Me Too. Any quotes we present uh, usually have, always have some text altered such that they can't be reversely identified through something like Google. We believe that these precautions, so kind of the data precautions, the construction of the model, 
and the general difficulty barrier of entry of applying all those together, make this a strong deterrent to misusing our approach. And given that we are trying to study Me Too so we can better understand environments in which people feel comfortable disclosing sexual violence, I believe altogether this justifies you know, the use altogether in terms of costs and benefits. Now, with all that talk, to actually come back to the model, I do want to assure you that the model did pretty well at its predictive task. So here I've listed a number of predictive metrics. Uh, we just ended up using log logistic regression. I think because we did many of the, the features on our own, other models did not do much better. Uh, the, the features we picked were quite informative regardless of models, so we went with the simplest one. And you know, so we have accuracy up to 87%, F1 of 0.82, which I would say are quite good for a social scientific context. And for anyone who happens to be wondering, this was quite a balanced classification task. So these are not uh, skewed by us doing well on disclosures or non-disclosures and missing the other. So what this gives us is a disclosure classifier, which we apply to 40, uh, 450,000 author tweets. Um, so these are tweets that someone uh, could have been making a disclosure or not, not retweets. And what I plotted here is the time series of them over the first week. You can see that most of them are descriptive and most of them are made within the first 72 hours of the hashtag trending. And they tapered off proportionally after that. With the disclosure classifier in hand then, what we wanna do is return to this question of network level reciprocal disclosures and how that might've helped the amplification of Me Too. So recall that we distinguish between descriptive and non-descriptive disclosures. And that descriptive disclosures indicate some level of more comfort with disclosing than non-descriptive disclosures. So we can't know who could have disclosed but chose not to, which might be our ideal scientific scenario. But we do know who disclosed with detail in those who did not. And so those that may have felt relatively less stigma in those who were not ready to share um, their story other than posting the hashtag me too. And so this is what we leverage. And we look at individuals who disclose and who they're following. And so here, this is an example of a follower network. And that's what this is representing. And this particular user here would be following four users. And what we do is, this is a person who has them, themselves will eventually disclose. What we do is before they disclose, we count the number of followers that made a descriptive and non-descriptive disclosure before this user here in the center disclosed themselves. You know, I'm gonna note these are only kind of potential exposures. Uh, we are using the follower following network here to give us an estimate of what that can possibly be, uh, but we don't actually know who saw what on Twitter around the time of Me Too. And so what we do is we take these people, we count the number of each type of disclosure they see before disclosing themselves, and we record whether that person made a descriptive or non-descriptive disclosure themselves. And the way we use this is what we can do is we can count the number of potential exposures someone had prior to disclosing and measure the probability that they make a uh, descriptive disclosure. So on the horizontal axis here, we have is a total number of potential exposures someone had to a disclosure. And on the vertical axis, we have the probability of a person who saw that many potential exposures made a descriptive disclosure. Like exposures and disclosures. Those words get mixed up a lot. Um, so if network level reciprocal disclosure reduced stigma, then what we would expect is that someone would be more likely to share details the more that they saw others in their network disclose. And this is exactly what we find. The more potential exposures someone had, more potential exposures to disclosures someone had prior to disclosing themselves the more likely that person was to share details with that, their disclosure. We can go even just a bit further with this. What we can do is look at the number of descriptive and non-descriptive disclosures someone might've been exposed to before disclosing themselves. So if network level reciprocal disclosures are reducing stigma, then what we would hope to find is that the more that someone saw others sharing their stories, so that is details with their disclosures, the more likely that they'd be to share details with their own disclosure. So what we have here is on the horizontal axis, we count the number of non-descriptive disclosures someone was exposed to. So for example, someone might've seen five non-descriptive disclosures. 
And on the vertical axis, we count the number of descriptive disclosures someone was supposed to. So they might have seen five non descriptive ones and 10 descriptive ones. And so for each combination of counts in this grid, we color it with the probability that someone made a descriptive disclosure of their own. Lighter colors here indicate that someone who saw uh, that particular combination of descriptive and non descriptive disclosures is more likely to have shared details with their own disclosure. And so that's what we have here. The dashed line indicates the line of equality. So these are people who would have seen the same number of descriptive and non descriptive disclosures. And underneath that line indicates those who saw more non descriptive disclosures than descriptive ones. And so the cooler colors here indicate that they are less likely to share details with their own story. And above that line indicates those who saw more descriptive disclosures than non descriptive ones. So the, the lighter colors here indicate that they're more likely to share details. And so overall, what we're seeing here between these two figures is that the more someone was exposed to others disclosing, the more likely it is that they shared details with their own disclosure. And further, the more that someone was exposed to disclosures with details, the more likely they were to share their own story with details and not just a non-descriptive disclosure. And this is kind of the crux of this work that we do here, but between this and our qualitative work together and some of the other quantitative work we do in our paper, what we do is we establish evidence that network level or simple disclosures are a likely mechanism for how Me Too emerged. So it's at this point that it's worth kind of acknowledging though that these disclosures did not all happen in isolate kind of by themselves. Um, and Me Too is not just about those disclosing. There are many people who contributed to the growth of the hashtag, including allies who are boosting survivors and others who are making tweets about the prevalence of sexual violence and many of those other themes uh, that I listed earlier. So what we can do is we can shift to a bird's eye view of the network and see what patterns there were and how people amplified one another as Me Too emerged. And so here, what I have is a timeline of the first nine hours of Me Too, marked relative to Alyssa Milano's Me Too tweet, which really kind of kicked things off. And what we're gonna do here is focus on four types of interaction. Three of those are amplification. We can base these on based on, you know, if we imagine we have those two nodes uh, on each end of one of those edges, like I had at the beginning, Someone who is on either end can be someone who disclosed or did not disclose. And there's different pairings we can look at based on if they retweeted, uh, how they retweeted one another. So first we can have people who disclose, who both amplify one another. We can have people who disclose to reply to others who disclose. We can have those who did not disclose, amplifies those who did. So this is kind of a signal of allyship. And finally, we can have those who did not disclose amplify others who did not, which can represent amplification of any of those non-disclosure themes I mentioned. And so here in the time series, what I'll be plotting is the proportion of all Me Too interactions that, one, that were one of these forms. And so this is gonna be, a, this is kind of a complicated figure. So I'm gonna to try to step through it time by time and point out the notable aspects of it. Okay. So, First, leading up to Alyssa Milano's tweet, those who disclose were primary amplifying one another. And so these are the teal dots that you see and the fact that they're higher than the other interactions that I have listed here. Following her tweet though, what we do, we see a spike in the number of those who did not disclose amplifying those who did. And these are, that's the spike in the purple triangles there that you see. And so as the hashtag's visibility increase, we can see there's a, um, you know, we can see kind of the start of allyship emerge in the network. And I also wanna point out that in the teal uh, squares, you can see a brief peak around uh, one hour after Milano Street. This is more replies between people who disclose, which is a brief signal of social support. Moving forward, as the hashtag starts to gain traction, those who did not disclose began to consistently amplify those who did. And again, these are the purple triangles and they form a steady curve um, for the first six hours or so. 
And this was the most prevalent type of interaction during that time, time period. But as that hashtag continued to gain traction, continued to gain visibility, what we begin to see is a steady increase in the number of retweets of those who did not disclose. And this is the upward trend in the black diamonds there. So overall, what we're seeing in general across this figure is that when Me Too started, amplification was heavily centered around those who were disclosing. And at first, it was primarily survivors amplifying one another. And then allies and others steadily began to amplify survivors. And as the hashtag began to really take shape, others began joining the conversation, even if they're not disclosing themselves. And so what does this actually tell us? It gives us a signal that among all these kind of individual disclosures, and the amplification that was occurring, there were larger patterns that were occurring with respect to how the amplification was coalescing into a larger network. And so while the network level reciprocal disclosures happen on this interpersonal dyadic level, together they form a larger network. And importantly, this network is not random. When we create this kind of network where the edges point from users to the sources they're amplifying, we end up with the core of the network those who receive the most links because they're the most amplified. These are the people who had the most compelling stories, those who made the witty viral comments, uh, other, other people like news media and celebrities, and their voices are the ones that are centered in the network. And around that center, radiates a periphery of everyone else in the network. And so these are the people who might've only shared one thing, posted just once, gave a quick comment, or otherwise just tangentially engaged with the conversation of Me Too. Because of this tendential engagement, sometimes they're derided as slacktivists, you know, slacker plus activists, because they're not contributing much directly to the conversation. But because the core relies on the amplification of the periphery, the core cannot exist without the periphery. And on the other hand, without a central set of actors to amplify, the periphery cannot form. And so it's only together that we can uh, begin to understand the structure of amplification if we consider both the core and the periphery. And so the central claim of my current research is that amplification can and should be understood with respect to core and peripheral actors together. And further, that network science gives us the tools to model the core periphery structure of amplification. Networks give us uh, a way to construct more detailed uh, both theoretical and computational views of what amplification looks like online. And so here's where we're shifting a bit into another line of work um, that I've been focused on recently. And it takes a step back and says, okay, well, if core periphery structure is so important, how do we actually model it? And so I wanna briefly talk about this and then I'm gonna wrap this back around to me to um, and connect it. Okay. Sorry, I'm just like realizing now the chat's been going. Uh, I have not been focused on it, but please interrupt me if there's anything that's pressing. Um, um, it seems like we can get to the questions later. So we have until 2 p.m. It's now 1.30. Great. Okay, awesome. Okay, so this question, so how do we model core periphery structure? Um, I'm, this is, I should be clear, we're not the first people to propose how to identify core periphery structure. There are many algorithms out there for identifying it. Um, but among the algorithms that are out there, uh, there's no reliable way to choose between them. So as it currently stands, you can fit one uh, core periphery algorithm to a network, you can fit another to the network, and then you have two different descriptions of core periphery structure, and you have no, one of, no way of saying which one's a better descriptor of how that network's structured. And so that's what our work addresses here. And broadly what we, Kind of propose is that there's at least two broad ways to imagine what core periphery structure looks like, and that we can turn both of these conceptualizations into statistical models. And so, what are these two types of core periphery structure? So, let's imagine that we have these two networks here, um, and we'll start by focusing on the one on, on the left. And what you might be able to see here is that there's a strong central hub where there are a lot of connections. And all the other nodes only connect to that hub and not each other. And so because of how we can stylize this, what we do is we refer to this as a hub and spoke core periphery structure. 
And then for the network on the right, there isn't as clear the separation. There isn't kind of just this core that mostly connects each other and the periphery only connects that uh, core. But rather than that simple hub and spoke structure, the network is better thought of in terms of layers. And these layers are nested in each other and get more dense as we move from the periphery to the core. And so as one would expect, we call this a layered core periphery model. And what we can do is use each of these conceptualizations of core periphery structure to arrange nodes differently between the core and the periphery. So the hub and spoke model splits nodes between a single core and a single periphery, while the layered model splits nodes among multiple different layers. And so these are the two types of core periphery structure that we kind of will be working with. But if we have network data, we do not know ahead of time which nodes belong in the core and which belong in the periphery. That's what we want to find out. And so what we want to do is be able to create those statistical models so we can tell us what core periphery structure best describes our network, and in particular for our case, what uh, core periphery structure best describes the structure of amplification. So I'm not going to go into heavy details with this, but I just want to give you an idea of how we might do something like this. And the way we do this is starting with the network's adjacency matrix. Um, so here the adjacency matrix, you can imagine it is um, all the rows and columns represent the nodes in the network. And what we do is we put a one, uh, you know, we fill in a one in the matrix if two nodes are connected and otherwise it's a zero. And so that's all the blank space that I have there. Now, if we have our adjacency matrix, and if we happen to know which nodes, if we kind of know, if we happen to know or we assume which nodes were in the core or which were in the periphery, then what we would be able to do is rearrange the adjacency matrix. Uh, it doesn't matter what order we have the kind of rows and columns in as long as we're consistent. If we order them a certain way, what we can do is kind of order them in this way that I have here is in terms of these groups or blocks where we start to see a particular type of structure uh, emerge in the adjacency matrix. And so what you're seeing here is among those core nodes that there are many connections between them, so all those ones. Between core and peripheral nodes, there are some connections. And between the peripheral nodes, there are none at all. And so this is the kind of structure that we assume exists if we want to identify hub and spoke core periphery structure. And by measuring the densities of these sets of links in our network data, we can abstract the description of the network using three probabilities. You know, the probability a core node connects to a core node, probably a core node connects to a periphery node, which is this P12, and the probability a periphery node connects to a periphery node, which is this P22. And we can do the same kind of thing uh, for the layered core periphery structure. We kind of set up what we call this block matrix. And these are what we use to define our core. These are really at the backbone of what we use to define our core periphery models statistically. Because mathematically, they allow us to encode uh, constraints on those probabilities and those constraints define the models. So the hub and spoke has this transition of density between uh, core nodes, core and periphery nodes, and peripheral nodes. And then the layered model has this hierarchy of increasingly dense layers. So these kinds of network models where we partition nodes into different groups and then model the connections between them are referred to as stochastic block models. And if that's something you're interested um, in, then there are lots of details in uh, our paper as well as many others. But now to step back. So what we have is two different types of core periphery structure. And we have statistical models for extracting them from network data, but what you might first ask me is whether it actually matters that we have two different types of core periphery structure. It could be just in practice, they yield very similar results. You know, they both have dense cores, they both kind of have light peripheries, a lot of differences just kind of in that middle. And so to examine this, what we're gonna do is look at how much the core and periphery can contribute to the reach of me too. So the total number of people who could have possibly seen it um, on Twitter given those who amplified it. And the way that we'll do this is by setting up a plot like the one on the right here. So this is just a schematic that we're first gonna walk through. What we'll be doing is measuring amplification reach, which is the cumulative, here we're 
operationalizing as the cumulative number of followers of all those amplifying the hashtag. So you take everyone in the network and you count up all their followers. And then what we're gonna do is vary how that reach changes as we include more or less nodes from the periphery. So for each node, we measure something that's called its coreness, which is a continuous measure of how closely a node falls to the core periphery. And so instead of placing nodes into these discrete groups of layers for core and periphery, we now have a threshold that we can vary. So we first increase the threshold a bit, which strips some of the nodes from the network. And because there are less nodes in the network, naturally the reach of the amplification will drop. We then increase the threshold uh, some more to see how the reach drops as we strip those nodes out until we reach the core, at which point we turn the threshold all the way up and the reach drops to zero because there are no more nodes left in our network. We've uh, kind of going through the whole corners threshold spectrum. And so this is, the, this is what we do for the MeToo network. We measure how the reach of MeToo varies as we move from the periphery to the core. And this is what it looks like with the actual data. So this is the actual plot. Um, I've plotted here how the reach of MeToo varies when we use the layered model of core periphery structure. What we see is we get a curve that looks something like the one I just showed you. Um, and the first thing I just want to point out is that notice when we turn the corner threshold up just a little bit, um, so just about 10% or so, so about 0.1 on this figure, we lose about 60% of the reach of the hashtag. And this tells us that the periphery contributes a significant amount to the hashtag's reach. Uh, so this kind of goes in the face of the slacktivist kind of charges. And so while those on the periphery may not be central to me too, the raw number of them means that they contribute massively to the hashtag's visibility. And this replicates uh, previous work that uses a similar approach. And we get a similar story if we use the hub and soap model of core periphery structure. You know, we see a very rapid drop in coreness um, that indicates that the periphery contributes significantly to the hashtag's reach. But notice that the amplification reach curves are different depending on whether we use a hub and spoke or layered core periphery model. You know, they're both being applied to the same network, but they yield different results because they assume the core and periphery are connected in different ways. And in fact, what our models tell us is that the hub and spoke is a better fit to Mitu's network structure than the layered model. And since the hub and spoke model is a better fit, this actually means that if we were to use the layered model, we would significantly underestimate how much the periphery contributes to the hashtag's reach. And so this is just one example of how we may model the core periphery structure and how this might affect how we uh, measure amplification specifically. And this is what my research is going forward. And I'll be looking at other reasons uh, that it's important to account for the core periphery structure of amplification. And I'm happy to talk about some of those ways um, if any of you are interested. So to summarize, you know, what have we covered? I feel like we've covered a lot of ground here. And first we talked about network level reciprocal disclosures and I provided some evidence that they're a likely mechanism for how Me Too emerge. We then shifted and I showed how as Me Too emerged, there was this transition from those disclosing amplifying one another to those who did not disclose amplifying those who did to those who did not disclose amplifying one another. And I argue that as we step back and take a look in aggregate, this kind of pattern can be described in terms of core periphery network structure. And I presented two characterizations of core periphery structure and showed how depending on how we model those statistically, they will affect how we measure online amplification. So uh, this work is not possible without uh, my lovely collaborators, Elizabeth Stowell, is a major collaborator on the our Me Too paper. Um, did pretty much as much work as I did on it. It's absolutely fantastic. Her advisor, Andrea Parker, was also uh, great on that project. And John Gabriella Young was essential on our core periphery work. And of course, uh, Brooke Fuqua Wells, my advisor, has been there for all of this, and she is wonderful as well. They're all brilliant folk. So thank you all so much for listening. Um, I'm happy to discuss this and take any questions that you have. Uh, thank you again. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ryan. That was uh, wonderful. Um, virtual applause.
uh, there's some virtual applause in the chat and the, you know, uh, where people show their faces on Zoom. <laughs> Thank you all. I just muted myself. So uh, <laughs> we have one question uh, from Abby. Do you want to ask your question? Do, do you want me to read it? Um, sure. Uh, Ryan, great talk. Um, and uh, I'm asking this question not because I don't think you've thought about it, not because I don't think your effect is real. Um, but what I want to hear about is how you think about homophily in terms of measuring this kind of um, increase in disclosures from exposure? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so Abigail's touching on this very like kind of crucial network question is like, how does homophily interact with diffusion? And they often kind of look the same when we use this observational data. Um, I don't think our work is able to kind of pull out homophily much from what we measure at the network level or civil disclosures. Um, what I would expect is that there are parts of the network where um, folks are connected exactly because they share some experiences and maybe even specifically because uh, they share experiences of sexual violence. And so on an individual level, yeah, actually, so I, I would expect that there's heterogeneity in kind of that figure uh, that I showed you, the probability of someone making a descriptive or non-descriptive disclosure. Um, I'm not sure what that heterogeneity might look like, um, but I think the homophily would kind of be another important, it, it would give you more information about whether someone would or would not make a descriptive disclosure. But I, I don't, I'm not sure I work and say much more than that. Um, all right, thank you. Um, there's a follow-up question um, uh, from, or suggestion maybe uh, from Jeff uh, in the chat. Jeff, do you want to speak out? Uh, yeah, thanks Ryan, this is super. I mean, every time I see your work, I think it's really cool. Um, <laughs> I guess I was wondering um, if there might be a way to use the timing of disclosures to sort of tease out the difference between exposure, which changes over time, and homophily, which is presumably fairly constant. Um, so like the, like the total number of my friends who at the end of two weeks disclose is different than the number of my friends who disclose before I do. Um, I don't know if that could give you leverage on the question or not. Yeah, so if we actually like want to start distinguishing these things and what the actual diffusion looks like. Um, I think it, we first need to think about what homophily we actually want to consider. Um, you know, so there's ones that we could potentially tease out computationally just from the data that we have. So for example, if someone's more left or right wing um, or, you know, uh, what, how popular different people are. Um, but there's other, factors that are not in our data would not be easy to get, uh, especially ethically, like things like gender, um, which I expect would be important here, gender, age, race. I feel like all these homophily effects would have uh, affect this interaction, but sorry, all these attributes would affect this relationship between homophily and diffusion. And so we could start to account for some of them, so even, but even if we are accounting for things like timing, I think we'd be missing a lot of the homophily effects. And there's also um, external effects that I think really complicate the story here too. Um, so here we're just measuring the follower network, right? But obviously people saw it on Facebook, they saw it um, on Instagram. Uh, we have people in our uh, data set who disclosed who have zero you know, exposures to me too, but obviously they saw it somewhere even if it wasn't in their following network for them to have made a disclosure. And yeah, you know, and there's a as it picked up, media started picking up on it. So I think there, I think it might be possible, but I the actual kind of causal question here gets very difficult very quickly. Um, and that's kind of why I try to frame this in terms of we provide evidence for rather than uh, we we have shown that network level reciprocal disclosure exists here. 
It's a good question though. Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. Um, are there other questions from the audience? Um, yes, while people think, um, I will ask one question. Um, so I was wondering if you have thoughts about um, what other contexts um, this type of network structure um, might apply, um, and if, if, if uh, there's any of that in your uh, kind of your own research or other ideas that you might have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, right, so we broadly expect this kind of network structure to appear for these kind of amplification networks and for this kind of specific link. And so the links that we're making in this network when I'm talking about core periphery structure are someone pointing back to the source of who they're amplifying, um, which is a little different than, you know, we don't need to go on this, is a bit different than the cascade kind of links. It's almost like we're skipping how it got to someone, but just the fact that they amplified someone else. Um, and when we have this kind of mechanism, we, we do see this structure a lot in, you know, for example, other instances of hashtag activism. Um, and we see a lot with political networks. So we may not see it for, we, we, we don't see it as much for non-political networks, um, but this is a structure we do happen to see in political networks a lot. And, but I think, so what, my, what I would hope to show going forward, um, you know, on other places like Reddit, where you can cross post across, you know, subreddits or TikTok, where you can almost literally amplify someone by kind of embedding their audio or video in your own. Um, I believe this structure should be quite common and this way of thinking about amplification should be able to apply across different contexts, as long as you have that, as long as you're kind of measuring that kind of link, that kind of network where you're measuring like source amplification. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, we have a question in the chat from Princess. Uh, would you like to ask a question or I can also read it? Uh, yeah, I can ask it. Uh, thank you so much for the talk, Ryan. It was really incredible. My question is basically if when you were doing your data analysis, whether you were able to gain any insight into if people who participated in the Me Too network had engaged in like prior gender related discussion, like did they have a pattern of talking about gender or talking about, you know, quote unquote, um, like, or, or talking about gender issues or the Me Too network was like their first participation? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, the short answer is no. Um, so we kind of focus just on this cross section of the two leaks. Um, but this is something that we kind of reflect on in our discussion. And I believe one of the other students in my lab um, is not necessarily looking maybe exactly at this period of Me Too, but she is looking at um, political participation online and how that varies over time. Um, and so I think, so that includes things like Me Too, but also um, things like Black Lives Matter, right? Which is now half a decade old, right? Or so, you know, five, six years old and how people have gone from not engaging with those topics to engaging with those topics. Uh, I'd be I'd be really interested in seeing how, um, you know, what the outcomes of this Me Too instance were, because I think, you know, we, we talked about disclosures, um, but it's almost hard to say if, whether it's good or bad that these people did disclose because we didn't see what happened after. Um, you know, did they stop tweeting? Did they start tweeting more about gender? Um, so the short answer is no. The longer answer is I'd be really interested in seeing if they if it did help lead to um, more discussion and gender related issues. Okay, thank you so much. All right, and we have Jane next. Uh, thank you for the great talk, Ryan, it was awesome. Um, I was wondering if you also looked at the amplification of tweets that try to troll or impede the Me Too movement. I, yeah. I'm especially um, curious about, I guess, uh, whether the amplification um, was worsened over time. Yeah, any, any high level thoughts would be great. Yeah, um, so we actually found in that early two week period, 
um, when we did our content analysis, you know, there was a subset of them that were tweets maligning me to, or, you know, trolling me to. It was actually like a very small percent of all of them. Um, oh. It was like one or two percent. Uh, and there could be a couple of reasons for this. It could be, you know, we, re we rehydrated our data quite some time after me too. Um, so it could be just the abusive tweets had been taken down by then. Um, I think that's part of it. I think what's probably more like those in my, how I remember me too, is it actually, many people started out in support of it. And then it was kind of over time as people ran into more murky kind of celebrity and political cases that there started to be a lot of tension around me too. And more the tro trolls were able to kind of make their way and divide the conversation more. Um, in terms of core periphery structure, this is something I have thought about um, is, you know, trolls or uh, even like coordinated information operations, like people who are trying to get in the middle of these discussions, you know, do we see them in the core of the periphery? Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, if we see them in the core, is it that they're being highly amplified or if they manage to kind of wedge themselves among other people who are highly amplified? So they might not be highly amplified themselves, but when they are mm -hmm. amplified, it's by those who are highly amplified. That would be a very successful kind of mm -hmm. stealthy information operation. So I think there's a lot of room to use this structure with um, the kind of adversarial actors on networks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, do we have more questions from the audience? Um, so uh, I have one more question um, with the, um, we talked about the homophily uh, issue earlier, kind of like following up on that. Um, I'm wondering if you have, you know, imagine that you had, you know, uh, consented data uh, that had people's, uh, you know, um, demographic information, like race, gender, age, you know, whatnot. Um, what, I'm wondering if you have kind of like speculations about what you would expect to see then. Yeah. I know it's kind of a broad and hard <laughs> question, but. <laughs> yeah, um, I should actually know, we, we do kind of have access to the data, we just haven't intersected that with our Me Too data. Um, I do some work with the laser lab with uh, David Lazar at Northeastern and they have their, they have a panel of Twitter users matched to uh, public US photo registration records, which have demographic data. Um, and that's, so that's the panel they use for their kind of, they, they have the classic, um, now classic uh, fake news paper on Twitter. So that's what's behind that one. Uh, so we couldn't look at some of these things. Um, in terms of what I would expect to find, um, I actually, I don't know if this is speaking as much to the homophily question. I would just be very interested though in looking at marginalization within Me Too and who was amplified. You know, so was it, you know, was it like white women amplifying other white women um, because there is a lot of qualitative evidence that um, you know, black women were not included in these conversations. Uh, trans women, uh, we wouldn't be able to do that. Um, but I think this would be reflected in the core periphery structure in the sense that if there was kind of marginalization, what you might find is that there's kind of one bubble. It's like the, those core people and all the people amplifying them but then other kind of smaller bubbles that have their own mini core periphery structures that are not part of that main conversation. And so I would expect that depending on where people are in the network um, and who those people are demographically would affect how people are disclosing in those different parts of the network. Yeah. And a, this is a small thing, but I think it's actually a really easy project that we'd love to see someone do is that like we looked at like the largest part of our network. So uh, this is like a typical thing, you kind of make a network and there tends to be like a really big part of the network and then there's a lot of other things. 
Um, there's a lot of people who did not get any interactions on their disclosures and just like, who are those people and what were they saying? Um, would be very interesting, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think conversations around kind of visibility and gets to be uh, seen and amplified is uh, definitely important. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, thank you so much, Ryan, for coming to us today and for sharing your work with us and for engaging in this thoughtful discussion. Um, really appreciate it. Um, yeah, virtual round of applause and uh, good luck in this final stretch of your PhD and uh, keep in touch.